Good evening. Good evening, everybody. I'd like to call the November 10th of 2015 meeting of the Salem Kaiser School Board to order. Our first order of business is the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise and repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please, Christy. Rick Kimball. Here. Paul Kylo. Here. Chris Brantley. Here. Marty Hyen. Here. Jim Green. Here. Chuck Lee. Here. Nancy Mac Morris Otics. Here. Okay, agenda modifications. We have none tonight, so we'll move right into it. And the first is spotlight on success. Superintendent Perry. Good evening. Our first spotlight tonight will be presented by Karina Lee, Executive Director of Salem Kaiser Education Foundation. Thank you. I would like to call Fran Magden and Betty Raymond, our volunteers of the month, up front with uh, our Chair Kimball. Over here, over there, Dr. Perry. And with them is Principal Linda Doherty from Battle Creek Elementary School. Our November Volunteers of the Month, Fran Magden and Betty Raymond, were nominated by Battle Creek Elementary School staff. The school staff chose these two remarkable ladies for the volunteer help they continually pro provide to the whole school. Fran and Betty have been volunteers for years and are really helping out Battle Creek again this year. They even spent hours working in the school this summer to help staff get ready for the students. Thanks to the district's new reading adoption, Ready Gen, Battle Creek received over 18,000 books for their classrooms and learning resource center. Working as a team, these two ladies went to the school and stamped all 18,000 books with property of Battle Creek Elementary. They worked steadily for a few hours each day until the huge task was completed. With school in session now, they are unfailing at the school, helping behind the scenes with teacher projects or assisting the office staff wherever they are needed, including counting out items for all of the students' Monday folders. The staff at Battle Creek Elementary and our entire community would like to thank Fran and Betty for volunteering so many hours of their time to support our schools and its students. Congratulations. Our business partner of the month will be presented by Jay Remy, our Director of Community Relations and Communications. Thank you, Superintendent Perry, Chair Kimball, and members of the board. Uh, our business partner of the month, and I think, you know, Mary and I were saying they could be our business partner of the century, <laughs> but since the partnership goes back 20 years, I guess it would be uh, the 20th century and the 21st century. But anyway, technically speaking, MAPS Credit Union is our business partner of the month. So if the folks from MAPS and Ms. Kilfoyle could come uh, forward. We would like to honor MAPS Credit Union as our business partner of the month. So from MAPS, we have President and CEO Mark Zook, Shane Saunders, VP of Administration, and Corey Frondiner, Director of Education Partnerships. <coughs> And from West Salem High School, we have business teacher Carol Kilfoyle. This is a business partnership that, as I said, we have shared for over 20 years. The educational branch of MAPS located at North Salem High School was the beginning of a most noteworthy partnership uh, undertaken by MAPS in the school district. During the 94-95 school year, Corey and Carol were tasked with looking into the possibility of developing a MAPS branch at North Salem High School that would provide advanced business students a platform to develop and practice employable skills and to learn and develop financial literacy skills. The Viking branch opened as a training ground for students to earn their certificate of mastery. So that tells you it's been a while. 
The students were provided with an abundance of opportunities to learn employment skills such as resume writing, completing job applications, and practicing interview skills. In addition, students were able to practice time management, problem solving, customer service, professionalism, cash handling, confidentiality, and the basic teller skills. Other important skills learned as an important part of the program were financial literacy, networking with professionals, and community service. What started out as a training ground for students at North Salem High School became a mini version of a MAPS credit union branch. The Viking branch turned out to be an award-winning prototype of an educational and business partnership. In 1999, the McKay Royal Scots branch opened, followed by the West Salem Titan branch in 2002. So thank you for partnering with us for the last 20 years and for the support you have given to the students of Salem-Kaiser Public Schools and our community. Thank you. And finally, our last spotlight will be presented by John Bate, Executive Director of Human Resources. Thank you, Superintendent Perry, Chair Kimball, and members of the board. I am particularly pleased and excited to share with you tonight the um, Oregon Substitute Teacher Association uh, invited every school to nominate a substitute teacher for the 2016 Substitute Teacher of the Year Award. Out of all the nominees, Salem-Kaiser Substitute Val Lukanen was recognized as the winner of the award at the Oregon Substitute Teacher Association Fall Conference, which was held here in Salem on October 17th. At this time, I would invite Val to come forward. And while she's coming forward, I also mention, I believe there are some members of the Oregon Substitute Teacher Association in the audience with us, and we're pleased that they're here tonight, so thank you. <clears throat> Val began her career with Salem-Kaiser Schools in 1990 as a grade 5-6 teacher at Fruitland Elementary. Her next 10 years uh, were at Waldo and Leslie Middle Schools, then four at West Salem High School, and ending at Walker Middle School for five years before officially retiring in June 2011. Val hadn't been retired very long before requests for her as a substitute were rolling in. Val has been substituting in our middle schools since August of 2011. Her most current assignment has been at Straub Middle School. Several teachers from Straub endorsed Val because in part, as Val herself was quoted to say, as a teacher she never wanted to be boring, but engaging and interactive. Straub staff have noted that students light up when they see her, knowing that the students will be engaged in learning and the class will be anything but boring. Thank you for the vital role you play in the Salem-Kaiser education system and congratulations, Val. on our agenda is audience communications on agenda items and we have three people signed up to speak uh, when I call your name please approach the podium and state your name and address for the record and could you limit your comments to three minutes please uh, we are running a timer I've got a couple lights up here yellow one comes on you've got a minute left and red one comes on I'm gonna be asking you to wrap it up so first is Eric Miller Hello, Chairman Kimball, Superintendent Perry, members of the Board of Directors of the Salem-Kaiser Public Schools. I'm Eric Miller. I'm the Salem-Kaiser Education Association President. I reside at 3275 Crestview Drive, Salem, Oregon, 97302. And I'm speaking on Board Policy BG-2. Regardless of how you vote on this policy, I would like the school board to continue to reach out to diverse communities to seek their input on educational issues. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, next, Pete Tiller. Good evening, Superintendent Perry, Chairperson Kimball, Board of Directors. My name is Pete Teller. I'm at 1465 Evergreen <laughs> Avenue Northeast here in Salem at 97301. I'm speaking as an individual tonight to the action item 3B, revisions to board policies, specifically the revision to board job description number two. 
The deleted language states that the board would determine and use, quote, proactive strategies to, to ensure constructive two-way dialogue for input from students, parents, and citizens as a means to link the entire community around the board's results policy, end quote. That language would be replaced with the new phrasing that states individual board members and or the whole board can gather feedback from students, staff, parents, and citizens, quote, that may help guide decisions facing the board, end quote. <clears throat> As an active member of the Salem-Kaiser NAACP, the Racial Justice Organizing Committee, the Oregon Education Association Human and Civil Rights Committee, and the National Education Association School Discipline and School to Prison Pipeline Task Force, I urge you to enlist and solicit feedback in a deliberate manner from all local advocacy, advocacy groups serving our students and families of color, no matter what version is approved tonight. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of bringing to the table all the voices of our community especially those voices speaking on behalf of our students of color so that our district can meet the needs of the few as well as the needs of the many. Chief Justice Sonia Sotomayor said it like this, unless we get quality in education, we won't have an equal society. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. And next, John Scott. Good evening, Superintendent Perry, um, Chairperson Kimball and Board Directors. My name is John Scott. I'm at uh, 1399 Greenwood Drive, Northeast, Kaiser, Oregon, 97303. Speaking as an individual um, to action item uh, 3B, revision to the board policy, specifically to number two. Um, the uh, proposed revised language gives me pause to the effectiveness and the effort um, to communicate with our partner uh, community groups of color. Um, I'm the liaison to the Oregon Education Association Human and Civil Rights Committee, uh, the chair to the Salem-Kaiser Education Association Ethnic Minority Affairs Committee, and I am a member of the African American Black Student Success Advisory Committee to uh, Department of Education here. And no matter what version of the language that um, is approved tonight, um, I cannot stress how important or how important enough it is to communicate and build relationships with our communities of color. Um, statistics do show that when our communities feel that connection, that invite to their education system, then our students are the real winners here. And so um, without that voice from a traditionally unrepresented group, you know, it it leaves us vulnerable to not really living up to the items in which we, we strive for as a great school district. So I urge you, regardless of the language, to make sure we have those communications, we build those relationships with our communities of color. Thank you. Thank you, John. Okay, that's it for audience communications. Uh, next are our action items for tonight. We have two. <clears throat> First one is a uh, proclamation and I'll I'll read through it here first. It's the National Education Support Professionals Day Proclamation. Whereas public schools are the backbone of our democracy, providing young people with the tools they need to maintain our nation's precious values of freedom, civility, and equality, and whereas education support professionals are an integral part of the education process, and whereas education support professionals provide a safe and healthy learning environment for students, and whereas education support professionals work tirelessly to serve our children and communities with care and professionalism, now therefore the Salem-Kaiser School Board of the Salem-Kaiser School District do hereby proclaim Wednesday, November 18th, 2015 as National Education Support Professionals Day. I urge that we observe this day by taking time to recognize and acknowledge the importance of education support professionals in our public schools. I have a motion. A I'd like motion to make a from comment. Paul. Okay, let's have, get it on the floor first. Okay. Motion from Paul. Do we have a second? Second. Second from Nancy. We have a first and a second. Comments. <coughs> Party. Uh, I just want to make a comment that uh, we throw around the word uh, democracy a lot. Uh, our elected officials do. Lots of people do. But as you remember, the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, we are a republic. We're actually a constitutional republic. We are not a democracy. And I just wanted to get that out there. Okay. 
<laughs> Any other comments or discussion tonight? Seeing none, we have a motion and a second on the floor to adopt the National Education Support Professional Day Proclamation as presented. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign. It's a unanimous vote, Christy. Second item we have tonight is revisions in board to uh, board policies. At our September 22nd work session, the school board reviewed and discussed suggested revisions to board job description BG2 and to agenda planning BG9. These two policies are attached and the suggested revisions are marked in the new in the, with the new language underlined and the language to be removed struck through. Uh, the suggested revisions align the policies with the current practices and activities of the school board. Uh, this item was presented on October 13th for first reading in our business meeting, and it's being uh, presented again tonight for uh, revision and adoption or rejection. So that's the presentation from the leadership. Do I have a motion? Move adoption. Move adoption by Jim. A second? Second. Second by Nancy. Discussion or questions? Marty? Yes, uh, I have a, I would like to propose a change. Is this the appropriate time? On a BG 9 number 2, the planning cycle will start with the what formerly said the board's, uh, basically the board's input. Think, thinking back to our August meeting, August the August meeting when we talk about policies is the only time that every board men, member has an opportunity to bring out any issues they have with policies. That's really their only opportunity. Uh, with this change, then um, <clears throat> they don't really have that opportunity. They have the opportunity to give it to board leadership, but if the leadership, the current leadership isn't in agreement, then it never comes to the light of day to the public or to the rest of the board. So I would like to leave the opportunity for the whole board to have a voice during that annual work session when we discuss policies. I'm not sure what you're proposing. Can you, do you have language? I'm confused. Uh, I, the, the language that was in there before, I, I think, was OK. We will start with the board's development. development of its agenda for the next year. And and that's going over the policies as well, is my understanding. So I would not change that language, I guess. I like the ability for everybody to have an opportunity to have something to say about anything in the policies at our annual work session. I don't, I'm not sure this takes that away. Okay. I don't see how it takes, it, see away. How it, takes it away. So this doesn't uh, pr make everything have to go through board leadership in order to be discussed in August? No, it, it could be brought up in August. At okay. The, at the annual that, that's my only concern yeah. is yeah. I, don't want, I don't want there to be any, any walls to getting information out in August. No, that's, uh, I don't think that's the case. Okay. Okay. Chris, uh, what, or did you have a second? Well, yeah, you had a second item. On BG2, you had something too. I'm I was going to say something on BG2. Um, I know Chris's concerns, and I'm sure he'll speak to those. And then, of course, hearing the concerns of uh, the testimony, um, I would move that we don't change the wording and we leave it as it was or modify it such that um, it's clear that we will be meeting with other groups and not just the stated people. That we, you know, uh, we'll be meeting with other groups, including, you know, the students and staff and everybody, but that we should also be meeting, meeting with these other groups, you know, like some of the people of color groups that they were talking about and different civic groups. Okay. Chris, did you sure. want to weigh in? Yeah. Um, I, I just say one more time that um, I'll be voting no on these changes and, and uh, I just want you all to know that I have found myself to be the sole voice in opposition to this now for what three or four months and uh, well actually for these changes just the last couple months but um, it made me spend quite a bit of time going back and think about why am I the odd man out on this issue and why is it that I feel so strongly that this is exactly the wrong thing to be doing. Um, and so I, sp I spent some time sort of looking at how other elected officials do their job, 
So I looked at the legislature and I watched legislators spend the lion's share of their time at the legislator in work, se work committee sessions, in subcommittee meetings, in committee meetings, and in all of those, people come before them, present their testimony, are asked questions, interact with, with the members of the legislature. Um, having served on the Higher Education Coordinating Commission in the TSPC, those meetings frequently have invited testimony where there is extensive dialogue that goes on between the board and the, um, and the, and the people who come before them. It's a two-way discussion. So then I went back and I thought about, and, and you watch our city council, same deal. They're, they have two-way communication. They talk with the people that come before them. Um, about what's the right thing to do and why. Um, and so I see this two-way communication as, as an integral part of being an elected board member, an elected um, legislator, or elected anybody. And so I come back and I look at our policy and I recognize that this policy was written when the board changed to a policy governance plan. And in policy governance, governance it's very clear in the writings that I've read that the primary, the primary, one of the primary roles of, a, of any board is to work with the owners, as the Carver model calls them, in our case that would be the community, to assure that there is a two-way communication to build the, the, to build the right for that group to govern. And, um, and I see that reflected in the policy that they adopted when they adopted that policy model. Now we are t taking this policy and instead of doing what the policy says, we are supposedly rewriting it so that it better reflects what we've been doing. I would question whether or not it does that because what we've been doing is not having those conversations for the six years I've been on the board with the possible exception, notable exception of when we hired a new <coughs> superintendent, we had extensive dialogue with lots of groups in the community about the characteristics of our new superintendent and how they responded to folks when we had those public forums. But beyond that, this board as a body hasn't done it. And specifically, it hasn't done it about what policy governance says is one of our primary roles, the results policy, and talking about the results policy. So I put that all together in my mind, and I cannot fathom why we think it's the right thing to do to take words like using proactive strategies to ensure, con ensure constructive two-way dialogue out of our policy. That's what we should be doing and we're taking it out ostensibly because that's what we've been doing and I would even question that. And then when you go on to the second one, BG9, and you see the words and will include and there are certain strategies in the, involved in that list that are designed specifically to assure two-way communication with the community. And we take the word and will out of there and says, which may include. It just is not strong enough for me in what I perceive to be my job as an elected official in working with the community that elected me. So again, I will be voting no, and vociferously no to this. I just think it's the wrong thing to be doing. Paul. I, I have listened and listened and listened and tried to understand. I do not know what you are actually asking me to vote on. Are you proposing, Chris, an actual <coughs> amendment, a change? Are you asking us just to vote no instead of giving us something proactive to vote on? If that's the case, then please just state it clearly because I'm getting lost in all the verbiage. I'm, a, I'm asking you to vote no on these changes. Anybody else? Questions or comments? Nancy. Um, I, first, I would like to say that I feel uh, that this board is very committed to conversations with our communities of color. And I have um, repeatedly asked questions about equity. Um, have asked for work sessions on equity that we've held, um, have our results policy um, data evaluation each um, annually involves very specific questions about how the um, every student in our district is doing. Um, so 
I, I am not concerned with this board that we will lose um, any aspect of our conversations with our um, various constituencies and their concern uh, for the education of their students. Um, I, I want to respond to Chris. Um, I've listened to Chris publicly chastise this board um, now on four occasions. Uh, we, have, we all came to this board with different experience and different perspectives. We also came to this board with different life situations. Some of us have full-time jobs and others are retired. Chris is retired and has the time to spend as many hours a week as he wants on school board issues. I have a job that requires me to work 24-hour shifts. In addition, we come from different perspectives. I was an involved parent and bring experience in South Area schools from Parent Club, LSAC, Booster Groups, Site Council. Chuck Lee has experience as an educator and school administrator. Jim Green is both an involved parent and an attorney who advocates for school boards at the legislature. Paul is a retired teacher and a union rep who understands issues in schools from both sides of many issues. Marty is an involved parent and has work experience in database and other IT management. Rick is a food scientist who has committed 10 years to leading this board to remain rooted in policy governance. This keeps the board from moving from the policy level to the administrative weeds. During my six years on the board, I have read at least 10 books on school issues, educational reform, and educational policy. As a group, we read a book on effective school boards and systems theory as it applies to the work of school boards. We have spent countless hours in work sessions understanding the initiatives our district has instituted to move the, child, the dial on student achievement, and that's student achievement for every student in the district. I've learned about techniques to improve teaching and learning. When I learn about these initiatives, I talk with my friends and neighbors who teach in our schools to learn about how the site-based implementation of the practices the district has described. I have followed closely the changes in curriculum and content needed to implement the Common Core. I know that my colleagues on this board have spent similar hours in pursuing learning opportunities to improve their abilities to act as informed board members. Jim spends his, life, his work life immersed in the issues surrounding schools at the legislature. Chuck has spent the last two years studying and implementing innovation in career technical education. He also regularly attends a meeting with the faith community run by the superintendent. Paul has visited at least half of our schools, visiting with principals and teachers to understand the issues they face. Marty has already attended an OSBA conference and begun the learning available for new school board members. Rick meets nearly every week with the superintendent to discuss issues and challenges facing the district. This time is spent focusing on the difference between administration and policy governance. In addition, he joins the superintendent in meeting with business leaders for dialogue on our schools from the perspective of business. In contrast to Chris's view of this board in abrogating the responsibilities for which we were elected, I am proud to serve with the members of this board who are committed to assuring quality education for every student of this district. Just because we do not agree with Chris does not mean we are uninterested or uncommitted to a quality education for every student and graduation for all students that prepares them for a successful life. I will vote in favor of the policy as it has been presented. Jim. So Rick, I think it's important for us to think about uh, the folks that spoke to us tonight about ensuring that our communities of color are involved in decisions affecting our kids. At our last work session we had, was it last week? Just last week. Mm -hmm. We saw the achievement results for our students and I think um, I mentioned to the board and I think we recognize we have an achievement gap or an opportunity gap, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I think it's something that we need to address and the only way we're going to address that successfully is if we bring in our communities of color for their suggestions, their opportunity to address what is needed for their students. Um, our school district demographics have changed dramatically in the last 10 years. And I think it's important we recognize what our speaker said to us tonight and that we include those communities of color in our decisions 
because what we decide here as a board really drives what we're going to do as a district with our boys and girls and I want to make sure that they understand um, at least from this school board member and I've heard it from all other board members on this board that we want to make sure we include those communities in our deliberations and our discussions because we only get better as a district if each and every one of our children depending on where they fall on the economic scale depending on if they're in one of the no child left behind subgroups we only get better if we bring each and every one of those children along so I really want to encourage this board to continue to have those discussions and bring those communities along as we move forward with our children Chris um, I, I just want to say that um, if people feel like I have chastised this board I have never done that. I have simply said that we as a group have never had conversations with any groups that come to us as advocacy groups. I have tried my darndest throughout these conversations to keep it from becoming personal. And I, have, I think I have done that. I think I have never said anything that did not start with the words that as a board we have not done this. <coughs> And if you have taken it personally and feel chastised, I am sorry. However, I continue to believe that taking our policy and saying that it's okay not to have proactive strategies around the things that policy governance says we should be having proactive strategies for um, is just the wrong thing to do. And I will continue to vote no. And, and again, I'm sorry if I've made you feel chastised. I tried to say it so that it didn't sound that way. All right, any other discussion or comments? Marty, on the, on the changes you're thinking about, I think if those are changes you want, you're going to need to vote no on this. And if it fails, then try to get those changes in. Uh, for the BG2? Well, because nine, I'm okay as long as what I was concerned with, what I was reading, <coughs> is that we lose our voice in August about any comments right. on any policies. And as long as that is not really what's happening I'm okay with BG9 right. I just don't want to lose that opportunity to be able to speak yeah, if, if two isn't where you want it you're gonna you know my suggestion is you do vote no so you can make it where you want it I mean that's what Chris is doing so right I understand Chris that. and I have one more I just thought of the other thing that I need to say everything that I've asked this board to do can be done by extending our board meetings by 15 to 20 minutes per session. None of it requires outside work. None of it requires anything other than changing some of the way we spend our time at board meetings. Anybody else? Chuck. Yeah, I'll just uh, I'll just mention that I'm going to be <coughs> supporting these changes. Um, I really feel that uh, they're well thought out I just want to be supportive of the things that I've heard from Jim and Nancy I respect Chris and his his uh, um, passion um, but I feel very strongly that as a board uh, we are doing exactly what Chris is, wants us to do I think it's more a matter of semantics okay. okay we have a motion on the floor in a second to adopt both of these policies as written we they're not separated in action so it doesn't help you with your problem Marty but we have a motion to adopt them both as written and a second all in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. opposed say aye aye no. okay we have I do oppose <laughs> five five in favor and two in opposition so the motion passes uh, the policies will be written as they've been changed to the state so Thank you, everybody, for your input and discussion. Next is the adoption of the consent calendar. On this part of the agenda, the, the school board, through a single vote, will adopt uh, items under grant budgets as well as personnel actions unless a school board member needs to pull an item for discussion. Marty. I'd like to pull an item. Uh, which uh, one? The first one, the adoption. Grants? Yes, the grants. Okay, so we're going to pull uh, 4A. Anybody else? I just have a question on the personnel one, so I think we need to pull it. Okay, we'll pull them both. We'll take them both up. Let's go with uh, the adoption of an appropriation of grant budgets. Marty, what was your item? I just had a question, uh, kind of for me and for the public, to know uh, more about what is um, the uh, teacher and administrator mentor program curriculum. 
All right, so I can take that. Um, the beginning teacher mentor and administrator is a state funded grant, so it's a competitive grant process. And what it does is it gives us dollars to hire mentors to pair with our first year teachers, uh, first, second, and third year teachers. So we actually have beginning teacher mentors as positions in our district, and they have a caseload of about 15 to 18 brand new teachers and their job is to mentor and coach them through that first three years of their teaching. Are, are they usually like a retired teacher or is there some sort of special education that they have to mentor other teachers? It's, um, they could have a regular education license and they are hired through a hiring process and then they're also giving tra given training on how to be mentors, oh, okay. and we actually have one of the premier mentor uh, programs in the state. And we've seen a decrease in, well, an increase in retention of those first three years in teaching. Okay, thank you. Is that the only item, Marty? Okay, can I get a motion from you to, uh, for approval of the uh, grant budgets? I make said motion. Motion by Marty, a second? Second. Second by Jim. All in favor uh, say <laughs> aye in adoption of the grant budgets as written. Yeah. Aye. 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 Sorry. Opposed? Same sign? All right. It's unanimous. All right, Jim, uh, on personnel. Uh, it's probably pretty easy. I just haven't seen it before. So when I look down under number five on personnel items, and not to pick on this person, but Barbara Svensson, and it says effective date TBD. I don't think I've seen that on the personnel actions before. I just wondered. So, Normally we have a start date for the person. I just haven't yeah. seen that before. I just wonder what that meant. I'm, I'm going to make a guess, and I'll look at John to see if it's the right guess. My guess is this person's on a contract in another district, and we haven't hasn't been released from the other district, so we don't know the start date yet. That's my guess because it's a mid-year. That's my assumption also. I would have to confirm that, but that would be the logical reason why we would do that. I just had not seen it before, so just wanted to know what it was. And uh, the TBA, because while the districts can hold uh, teachers to 60 days, generally what happens is somewhere prior to 60 days, they end up releasing them to the right. other district. Thank you. Right. Yeah. How about a motion to approve the personnel actions as written? So moved. So Second. Moved by, Second by Nancy. Moved by Jim. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign. Unanimous, Christy. <coughs> All right, let's move on to readings, which there are none tonight, so we'll go on to reports. We have two reports tonight, one on uh, EL5 and then a strategic plan report. I'll turn it over to Superintendent Perry. Uh, this is the executive limitation report number five on staff compensation and professional development and it's the fifth of our 12 monitoring reports and um, in relation to staff compensation there is one major change not an evidence of non-compliance but if you look um, at number four last year um, in collaboration with ASCII ESP the professional technical group of employees was um, established there, a non-association um, represented group. And this new employee group for Salem Kaiser, which includes staff who are non-licensed and responsible for supervising other staff and are responsible for operating a program. The professional technical group is not part of a bargaining unit. Since the inception, this group is meeting and conferring, because we have a meet and confer process with district leadership. And so we have not yet established a salary schedule. So it's a one group that's kind of working without that salary schedule. We are not worried about that. It was just a little bit of a timeline gap in the change in um, HR leadership. So we're working through that with them, and I have no worries. Other than that, we have no evidence of noncompliance, and this report is really similar to the one you received last year. Any questions or discussion? This is, uh, the, the, the reports on the executive limitations all become part of our evaluation of superintendent. So I'm looking for a consensus that this report is I adequate. I just have a quick question. Go ahead, Jim. So we, we did a reclassification of some of our classified employees about a year ago, two years ago maybe it was. True, I think. Well, we moved, we we moved, moved some. We moved some. some. We moved some. We moved some. Yes. Is, is yeah. there anticipated that we're going to do that again? We um, usually engage in that process through a classified compensation study. You saw that last year, and right. that's a rotational thing we do. Okay. We aren't expecting it this year, but we would, um, within a two- to three-year time period, again, have that compensation study. Okay, thanks. 
So uh, thumbs up, everybody is adequately born? Okay, all right. So we have consensus on that. Let's go ahead and go on to the uh, strategic plan report. Okay, and I'll turn it over to our directors of elementary education. Yes. So Superintendent Perry and Chairperson Kimball and directors, my name is Heidi Litchfield and I'm joined by Sandy Price. And we're here to represent the elementary directors to, um, to talk about positive behavior supports. Oh, thank you, Vanna. <laughs> trying to make it work. I think we have a, a screen that's not on yet. Not on yet. It was on earlier. We had to turn it off for the spotlight and we didn't get it back on in time. There we go. Awesome. Perfect. So tonight we're going to give you a report on strategic plan number six, um, which is to create a framework for behavior support systems in elementary schools. So um, last week in the board work session, we uh, presented the elementary assessment data, which um, really displayed some encouraging trends in our elementary data, particularly in the area of academic growth. However, prior to the last year, the three-year trend for elementary schools showed declining results in math and reading. And additionally, recent data has shown an increase in student behavior issues that have led to the corresponding need for more behavior specialists in the elementary schools. And also because we know that creating a positive learning environment will lead to increases in student achievement, having a positive behavior support system in each of our schools has become one of our main goals for elementary schools. So I'm going to turn it over to Sandy. So, in spring of 2015, Superintendent Perry put together a work group comprised of elementary principals and other district leaders to explore what options would help us achieve the strategic plan number six. One action taken was the collection of a baseline data for basic school-wide features and the degree to which they were in place for all of our elementary schools. And so this graph shows the variability of that implementation of school-wide behavior support features. And I'm gonna show you in this next slide what those features are. So this, this is a system evaluation tool, average scores across all of those schools you just saw in the last slide. And you can see that the goal is an 80% minimum for all of those features down at the bottom for a school-wide system. So, expectations defined, expectations taught, a reward system, a violation system, decision-making, management, and district support. There's all kinds of information behind all of that. But the main point is, in the spring, we decided as a work group that we needed some kind of measure to help us see where we were starting from. And so the system evaluation tool, all counselors, all elementary counselors in the district received training and in a day went out in pairs to schools that were not their schools to uh, gather this information using this tool. And you can see we have a lot of strengths to build on to get to that 80% minimum in place. And so why do we need positive behavior support? Why do we need to go down this route? Well, we know social-emotional learning is something that will help support academic achievement and it will help us to uh, build a foundational support for even greater levels of social emotional growth for our students. We know that creating positive learning environments will lead to increases in academic achievement. The components of a school-wide behavior support system include that we build from outcomes, academic achievement, social competence, and safety. And when you look at these, uh, these features, we are talking about them in terms of cultural, equitable, relevant, knowledgeable, and valid practices that help us make sure that our systems are in place and that we're making decisions organizationally to support not only student behavior, but staff behavior to support student behavior.
from the public health model, we know that if we have a healthy system in place, practices should capture about 80% of our students in, within the normal school-wide system of primary prevention. So school, classroom-wide systems for all students, staff, and settings. And when you think back to the data you saw earlier, this is those features of a basic school-wide system. But we're also looking at the secondary prevention system for specialized group systems for students with at-risk behavior. And finally, at the top of the pyramid, students who might need specialized individual systems. And if we're able to build the system, then we spend more of our time on prevention and more access for students to their academics because their behavior is within the limits of the positive behavior supports. So we invest in prevention first. We have multiple tiers of support and intensity and early rapid access to support. And Heidi will tell you more. So our plans for this year uh, begin last spring. Um, as Sandy explained with the set data, the gathering that information from the schools and will continue for the next few years. One of our main areas of focus will be to develop that common vision in our district and in our schools around what a healthy learning environment looks like and feels like to staff and students. And we also plan to increase our leadership capacity by growing our own network of behavior specialists and counselors who have a deep understanding of what those positive behavior supports look like in an elementary school with the idea that uh, full implementation of PBIS in all schools uh, will happen by the end of 2019. I think that's any, it. Any questions on this report? Um, Marty and then I'll come to Jim. Could I get a copy of the slides emailed to me, please? We'll make sure that happens. Okay, thank you. And then, um, so are, are we like tracking information about individual students? Is that how we're determining that they fit in the 80% or the 15% or the 5%? That's a great question. <clears throat> in the model that you looked at, um, in a school-wide tier one system of just that basic primary prevention, mm -hmm. um, Generally speaking, the measures are if your students have one or fewer office discipline referrals, then they're considered to be within that 80%. In the yellow zone, students who have two to five office discipline referrals are generally referred to being in the yellow zone, so needing that secondary prevention as a group. What kinds of supports can we give them? And if there are more than five office discipline referrals, they're generally spoken of as being in the red zone and needing some more individualized support for high-risk behavior. Is any of it subjective as to what the reason is that they're sent to the front office? or? So as part of the system of what's put together, and I'll try to go back to that school-wide um, in the course of staff coming together to agree on what the expectations are in the definition and how they're taught and what that violation system is in place, there's a lot of conversation facilitated and led by leadership in the building to come to consensus around what does constitute an office discipline <coughs> referral versus what a teacher would be expected to work with in their classroom. Okay, so somebody may get sent to the office, but it may not be defined based on their definitions for that school and office discipline event, basically. So they would have all teachers, part of, part of this um, measure is that teachers would be in agreement with those basic uh, understanding of what would constitute an office discipline referral. So when they do the data collection, one of the questions that is asked is for what reason would you send a student to the office? And in order to um, achieve a level of 80% or more, 
the staff that are interviewed independently would um, say the same thing. We would send a student to the office for fighting, for instance, <coughs> and that would be a common understanding. And then you said that it was being done at each school, so two elementary schools could have different uh, offenses for being sent to the office, or do you think they'll generally be the same? I think they would generally be the same, but it is a school-based process. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I have two questions. As I read the board plate here, um, it talks about, and you mentioned it, I think, Heidi, at the beginning of your presentation last spring, a work group of elementary principals with oversight from the directors got together. I'm just wondering, was there input at that point from the teachers? Because the classroom elementary teachers are going to be the one implementing this, and I want to make sure that it's, while I understand at certain levels we need to have our principals, you know, kind of deciding some things that are going to go on in the school, this is talking about behavior and supports within the classroom. I want to make sure the teachers are supportive of this mm -hmm. and that they were included in that at least initial discussion as opposed to, because sometimes I hear from our elementary teachers and teachers in the district, well, this was just brought to us. They didn't seek our input. Mm -hmm. There are a number of uh, readiness building activities that happen at the building with the principal, the counselor, the behavior specialist. And so we did have behavior specialist counselors, and we did have input from teachers and classified staff from each of the buildings represented. Okay. And I think what I heard when I was out and in my communication groups is that that really big escalation of student behavior. And as we dug into it, we know that a piece of that escalation means we have to have systems in place in school. So yes, it's uh, one system that teachers need to work through, but in, if you go back to the schools, that are, the schools that are high, those teachers have better learning conditions would be my sense because they, they are all have the same expectations. So is it then the anticipation, Superintendent, that we'll get a report on this as we move forward to see where those schools are on that continuum as we move forward? Not identifying the schools, clearly, but yeah. at least, you know, hopefully we'll get more towards the 80% yeah. than where correct. some of our schools are. Yeah, correct. And so I, the, go, go ahead. Yeah, the idea would be that you would get that information every year and that we would be gathering it and could present it to you so that you could see trends in more schools achieving higher results. And my second question, if you could go to that pyramid, the one that had the tertiary, secondary. No, oh, that one. That one. So <laughs> I, I know it's in there, but you didn't mention it, and I'm just a little concerned we didn't mention it. At what point do we have engagement and outreach to the parents? because a lot of what may happen in the classroom, you know, could be home brought or it's a cultural issue and other things. I wanna make sure that, you know, this is a system that's gonna involve the parent mm -hmm. in, in these engagement processes as we move through. And I'm assuming it is, I just didn't hear it. Yes, at every level, um, actually parent, um communication is part of every level. So even at the school-wide level, one of the pieces that is part of the planning is, and how are we going to communicate this widely and broadly and get not only communication one way, but parent support back. In the um, yellow and red zones, there is actual regular communication with parents and planning with parents for both of those preventative pieces. And I'm assuming at the green level, it's more than just saying this is our behavioral plan for our school that's like put in the student handbook at the beginning of the year. It's an actual communication related to this to parents. And more than once, yes. Okay. And for kids, it's more than communication, it's teaching behavior expectations. Sure. And reinforcing before it gets to a referral. Some of our schools who are early adopters are actually making videos with students so that students are doing the examples of what you would want to see in schools. The teachers are doing the non-examples of what you wouldn't want to see and the kids are loving it. So uh, I think s many of our schools are further along than others. Great, thanks. Thanks, Rick. Yeah, Nancy. So um, is PBIS new to the district um, starting with this work group? or is it something that's been being used in our schools uh, previously or just in the schools that are approaching the 80%? Or? So that's also a really great question. Actually, about eight years ago, 
there was training here in the district on safe and civil schools and there are still many components of that training still in place which is why you see what you see in terms of not being at zero we have some things to build on and why some schools are further ahead than others is multi-fold um, some have been early adopters with PBIS through their focus plans have actually been working with um, consultants and have already been implementing and some are just continuing to implement from eight years ago the training that happened safe and civil schools and positive behavior supports are based on the same research base and so it's really the same pieces just a different brand name and just to follow up is this something um, that is really just applicable to elementary schools or is this something that we're using beyond elementary or when you have implemented it really effectively in the elementary schools then by the time the students get to middle school they're all just perfectly well behaved and <laughs> been to a middle um, school <laughs> oh yes that's it Nancy that's it <laughs> I have been to a middle school I <laughs> Much of the training that elementary um, schools are receiving right now through behavior specialists and through counselors, the middle schools are joining in on as well. So it, it is um, something that I think will continue to grow, uh, especially as it gets success in the elementary schools. I think um, that will just naturally happen as well. But also Matt Biondi is seeking that and um, initiating getting um, some of his behavior specialists trained. Great, thanks. Yeah. Could really be K-12. And one of the things I saw out in my listening and out in schools last year was that while we had pockets of strong behavior programs, we didn't have a consistent focus on. So schools were really in varying degrees of almost crisis at times over student behaviors because they weren't, we didn't consistently say you've got to have a system. So we put the structure around, we've got to build this system. And again, it, it perfectly duct dovetails with safe and civil schools work. So that's why you see some of those schools that are higher. And even the safe and civil schools um, leadership and those schools are taking the PBIS and expanding on what they're doing. Chris. I'm gonna get back. Yeah. We just got an in-service before the meeting about staying near the <laughs> mics. Um, my question has to do with growing, growing it and taking the, your slide that shows we're not at 80% and trying to get there. Um, I'm aware enough of PBIS to know it's been around for 15 years or so now and that it, that it grew out of U of O, I believe. Are we, you, how are we getting our behavior specialist and our counselors and the different people who are doing the training in our buildings trained? How, yeah, how's that work? <laughs> and, and, is, and is that system enough to get it to grow into all of our elementaries, middles, and highs? That's a really great question, too. Um, right now, this um, year, all of our behavior specialists and in buildings where they don't have behavior specialists, their counselor or some other identified behavior point person is meeting monthly with a behavior specialist program assistant at student services. That's an investment student services is made in this process. And I was partnering with a consultant that we've been working with at the elementary level, a PBIS consultant, who are providing monthly trainings to those it's an army, K-12 army, of behavior specialist, behavior point folks to learn about those features that we talked about as well as some of the secondary and tertiary level supports as well. So that's one thing that we're doing on a regular basis. Yeah, thank you. I was just thinking it's a huge task to try to get this works because everybody's sort of on the same page. <laughs> and how do you get everybody on the same page? I was wondering how you're doing that. And our plan is not just one size fits all because we have schools at varying degrees of proficiency with this. So we will have um, several cohorts of um, schools that will um, work together because they're at similar places with implementation. So we'll, we'll try and group them so that they're not having to start at ground zero, but they can build on what they already have established. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Sandy and Heidi. We're looking forward to hearing progress over the next couple of years. All right. That's it for reports tonight. Next <coughs> informational, if you look at our schedule of meetings, we are not going to have a work session at the end of this month. 
Our next meeting will be on December the 8th. We have not set up a topic yet for the work session at 5 o'clock. Keep that time open. Audience communications on non-agenda items is next. Get one person signed up. Uh, three minutes at the podium, please. State your name and address for the record. Uh, Brad Cunningham. Uh, my name is Brad Cunningham. Uh, I live at 1542 Freedom Loop Southeast, Salem, 97302. Uh, my comments are on class sizes um, and my um, extreme concern for them and, and the, the amounts. So two years ago, I moved here with my family from another state where the state had a class size amendments of approximately 18 kids for elementary and those classes the core classes for middle school, 22, 25 for high school. And here we see in Oregon, uh, elementary class sizes between 30 and 35, middle school 35 to 40 for core, high school 40 plus. So when we start looking at this data that everyone's showing, uh, elementary, for example, if the goal is to have 80% um, success rate for non, for behavioral issues, we have six kids in a classroom of 30 that meet these behavioral problems. And the class sizes um, compounds that greatly. So for teachers, I found here um, uh, are very dedicated and excellent quality, well-trained, but they're very frustrated themselves on the class sizes. They can only do so much. I know the principals are, parents, and we see the data of Oregon being extremely poor and the educational side. And I really need to know what can be done to solve that problem. It's unfair for the teachers. The students are, who are high achievers are not getting pushed. The students of low income, or in the case they would be, or, or those in um, uh, lower academic success are not getting pulled up. Those in the middle are being not brought up or down, they're getting bored in school, and therefore you're losing them. So if we have a room full of 100 people here, 100 kids here, 35 of them aren't gonna graduate. <clears throat> so we have some, some extreme problems that I see, and I have seen it firsthand, moving from another state to here. I spent myself a couple years in a classroom, so I know the, the scenario behind being in a class I worked in the school district myself for a number of years in operations, so I see what's happened in those districts, and I really want to know some answers on how this is going to be solved. Now, I don't know if I'm able to ask questions, but um, this is something that is, I don't see a solution in the near term, and I have a student in elementary school who we are look, I'm a very big supporter of the public school system, and I come from a family of educators and, um, you know, very supportive of public schools. But I'm having to consider putting my son in a, a, a private school because he's bored. He has no interest in really going to school and learning, and I don't really want that to happen. I want him to go to public school to see the diversity and uh, the different... Um, academic possibilities that there are, but he's not getting them. Not even really close. Okay, thanks, Brad. We got your name and number here. Staff will be reaching out to you, okay? Thanks. All right, we had one person sign up, so we'll move on to uh, board reports on activities. Anybody have anything you want to report about on the last month or so? We'll go with Chris to start with, and Marty looks like she's getting ready. I just have a, a couple things, just sort of reports back. Um, the Racial Justice Organizing Committee, you heard Pete Teller refer to it, he's, he's involved, is, is the group that has grown out of those two presentations that were done in the community on the history and then the, and then the plight of um, minority folks in, in the state of Oregon. Um, the or they have now organized themselves into three subcommittees having to do with activities and and how to learn together and a number of um, different ideas and those three committees are all working together and they're meeting as we sit here this evening 
across town, and so I'm not real sure how that, that's all coming together tonight, but um, that group continues to operate. I continue to, to attend <coughs> as I can, and uh, just wanted to let you know I'm staying involved with that, so if you're interested in more detail, I can provide that. The other thing that I'll, I'll tell you about is that um, through my work on TSPC, I'm now part of their subcommittee that's trying to implement the new law having to do with um, how cooperating teachers are trained in the state of Oregon for, um, for fledgling educators, for pre-service teachers um, going through their student teaching experience. And I just wanted you to know that um, prominent at the table are Mary Cadiz, um, Karen Spiegel, two members of the coaching community here in and one a former mentor teacher here in, in Salem Kaiser um, the kinds of things that you've heard about as being part of that um, teach Oregon project that's happening in some of our schools in Salem Kaiser is um, prominent on the table as are all the other teach Oregon projects um, so while that isn't to scale yet in Salem Kaiser or anywhere else it is definitely the model that um, tends to be taking the day so we're we're doing it right in some of our places already so hopefully that'll grow some more so those are the two things um, you know I've been to some other things this month but those are the two things I felt like I wanted to report to you on. all right thanks Chris Marty yes I went <clears throat> to my very first crystal apple awards and it was very encouraging to hear about teachers and administrators and staff going the extra mile for our students and our community and I found it very uplifting, and I just wanted to congratulate again the nominees and the winners of those awards, and that I personally know a few of them, which makes me even more proud. <laughs> so, that's it. Thanks, Marty. Anybody else? Jim. So just with the Christmas and holiday season coming up, I encourage you as board members to get into our schools and go to our concerts. Um, we are one of very few districts in the state that have elementary orchestra, and they perform at their Christmas performances. Also, uh, the Capitol <coughs> will be having our choirs perform. You can go to the Capitol <laughs> website and look at the dates and times. So if you're in the downtown area, it's a good way to spend your lunch. Go listen to our choirs perform. And I can tell you, um, spending a little bit of time at the Capitol and hearing the choirs, uh, you can tell why our choirs win state championships. So I encourage you, as we get into this, to head into the elementary schools, the middle schools, the high schools. They're great Christmas holiday concerts. Thanks, Jim. Nancy. Um, I, I didn't go to the Crystal Apples. I watched them on TV because I was post-call and was exhausted. But um, I just want to comment on what a wonderful thing it is to honor educators in this way. Um, I you know, the whole red carpet and really um, it, really honoring the work of these educators. I think every year um, the, the people who are nominated, how is it that they pick the 10 that they pick? They're all phenomenal. And I hope that everybody walks out of that um, building that night feeling like they're a winner, even if they're not selected as a crystal apple because they're all winners and we're really fortunate to have that um, level of dedication in our district and I think that that the nominees and the winners are the tip of the iceberg in our district and I just hope there are ways that we are communicating that to our teachers each and every day um, and our support professionals that they are really doing an amazing job and um, probably all deserve to receive those crystal apples. Thanks, Nancy. Anybody else? Chuck. A um, little bit of a conflict of interest, but SCEF does a great job putting on that Crystal <laughs> Apple Awards. I mean, yeah, um, I, I go to it every year um, because I have to. <laughs> no, because I want to. And uh, I just feel like uh, the, the whole team at the Salem Kaiser Education Foundation does a great job of uh, they've, they've really created a, a, a great evening for teachers. And also, you know, the other thing that uh, SCEF did well is they had uh, their annual Harvest Fest dinner uh, at Red Hawk Winery, and uh, uh, that was a huge success. To take off my board hat for just a second, I was really pleased with the dedication that we had for the SeaTex Center. I know several board members were there, and we had over 250 people come, and, and uh, thanks to Ross uh, and... Uh, Sodexo for uh, providing uh, uh, refreshments and things. 
And uh, uh, also I got a chance to go to Chemeketa Community College and they unveiled their new uh, uh, Career Technical Manufacturing Center and it is impressive and just a great addition to the community. So uh, there's a lot of great things happening out at Chemeketa and uh, I was just really excited to see some of the th some of the things that they're doing with this new facility that they've got out there. Marty. I just wanted to second what Jim said about the Capitol. I used to work at the Capitol, and there was nothing more awesome to hear those voices in the rotunda. It is just absolutely fantastic. And if you've never been, please try to go. Right before I turn it over to the superintendent for her comments, I wanted to ask what troop the Boy Scouts are from here in the audience. Are you working on a civics merit badge tonight? Yeah. You are, huh? <laughs> All right, well, welcome. What troop are you from? What troop are you from? 167. All right, well, welcome. Uh, Chairperson Kimball, I, one other thing I meant to mention is uh, it's been kind of an honor for me to serve on the Claggett Creek Middle School Counseling Advisory Board. and. Uh, Claggett Creek is doing some incredible things with their counseling department, going after some very high-level um, certifications and things. So uh, they're hardworking, doing great work, and uh, I was out there today for a meeting with that group, and uh, good for them for going the extra step to uh, try to uh, bring good counseling services to our middle school students at Claggett Creek. Thanks, Chuck. Superintendent Perry for closing comments. So uh, I just have one kind of highlight. Um, I had a chance to go to Washington, D.C. with both Ask ESP and SKEA um, a week or so ago now. And I um, hopefully the two uh, members from the Equity Committee can, will, will understand and know about that work that we had a chance to accomplish um, during our time together because it was really focused on um, recruitment and retention of um, teachers of color, but more importantly, it's, it's not just about recruiting, it's about what do we do as existing um, staff, as existing teachers, as existing leaders, and how do we, how are we sure that we have culturally responsive practices, that we have a district that meets the needs of each and every student, and the ability of labor management to have that level of a discussion at the NEA headquarters with some trainers with us, I think was really um, important for us as a district. And I know from my um, perspective, I was um, really thrilled with the conversation and the ability to be invited to that. It was um, unusual, if not unheard of, that it, there was an actual joint labor management team. It was mostly association leaders, Uniserve reps. So we were the standout district to say, wow, you have all of it together um, as a team thinking about how do you advance issues of equity in your district and in your community. So that was um, a great highlight for us. It was great um, for us to really think about that as leaders, both on the teacher, the classified, and the district side of how do we move that work. So hopefully for um, Pete and for John, they will see from us as leaders the um, real desire and b to begin working out the plan for advancing that conversation and that work. So um, thank you, um, I think, to Roxanne, who helped get the invitation, but to both Ask ESP and SKEA for inviting the superintendent along, because I was the uh, minority in the room, <laughs> being the only only administrator, I think, there. And I felt pretty okay about that. So, but we um, really, I believe, it was a springboard for some important conversations for us. Good. Okay, with that, I'm going to adjourn this meeting. Thank you all for coming down tonight.